What is up, Zimmer? Thank you so much for jumping on the AIM podcast. Yes, thanks for having me, Doug. I'm super excited to be here. Should be a lot of fun to be able to talk many different things today. You were the first guest on the AIM podcast that I think could compete with me at a shooting contest. Hey, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good to hear. Hopefully, uh, you know, that would be a good competition. We'll have to do it one day. Hey, let's do it. We, uh, there was one metric that we would use at Western Carolina, and our coach, uh, Mark Prosser, he used this to see if guys could shoot threes in the game. We did a five-minute shooting drill. Um, right. I'm sure you've probably done something similar, if not the same. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was, a, that was a fun one. You know, we would crush that. I think the best I ever got was 77 um, in five minutes at the top of the key. So that was my little no. my record. I love it. That's it. That's impressive. That's impressive. I, yeah, I've done things similar, maybe not full five minutes, but yeah, I've definitely done a lot of time shooting and everything in my day. So, and uh, I'm sure I'll be doing more as I keep, as I keep going. Absolutely. Did you guys have a go-to drill that your coach would implement for, for guys that could, if they could shoot in the game? Not really, to be honest with you. Our coach was, you know, he wasn't as much as the skill development guy. He left that to our assistant coaches and he was focused solely on the team. He was like, Hey, you guys do what you have to do individually to get better. I'm going to focus when I come into the gym, it's going to be about our team, what I need to do to get better, what we need to do defensively, offensively in order to, uh, to help us out. And, and then he left that to the assistant coaches and kind of on our own to, to get better. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm, I'm excited by this episode. There, there's several things I'd like to hit on with you. Um, but prior to, prior to doing that, I think just getting a little bit into your background could be helpful for those listeners out there, just kind of touching, you know, kind of how you got to BYU and then obviously professionally. Um, but just telling a little bit more about where you're from, kind of your story to get to BYU would be awesome. Yeah, so I'm from upstate New York, small town called Glens Falls, uh, about 14,000 people. Um, you know, not a, not a whole lot going on up there. Uh, great town, love, love being there in the summertime, specifically a lot of lakes. Um, a lot of things to do. It's, it's great. My family still lives back there mostly. Um, so I always go back and visit with my family and my kids, but, uh, you know, so I was there and it's from a small town. So not many people knew who I was, you know, growing up playing basketball, I started to get into the AAU circuit, um, you know, and played with the Albany city rocks. And we started to kind of go around and play in some big tournaments and everything, but, um, you know, I wasn't super heavily recruited when I was, uh, sophomore in high school going into my sophomore year I went to a camp out at BYU just like a generic normal basketball camp uh because my dad was like it'd probably be a good idea just go out there so that they can know who you are like they have no idea who you are so I went out there and played in the basketball camp and coach Rose was kind of walking around and saw me and one of their players was like hey coach you should probably come watch this kid play he's actually pretty good and coach was like all right so I'd see I'd see coach every once in a while come in and kind of look and be like huh that's interesting and then he kind of walk around he's like who is this kid try to find out and he, he saw that my dad was there started talking to my dad and then you kind of see a coach um, come in every day with a, one of the different assistant coaches and coach Rose and and uh, they kind of got my information and then at that point ever since then they kind of followed me uh, throughout my AAU career and high school career um, so it was basically down between BYU and Siena those were the two schools Siena College was close to where I grew up, about 40 minutes away. Uh, Fran McCaffrey was the coach. They had a good program. It was between those two schools and everybody else. I, I didn't really get offered by almost anybody else. There was a few other small schools that offered me, but nothing from any big Big Ten, ACC, um, no, no big schools or anything like that. So it was kind of BYU, Siena, and I chose BYU and went down Went over to BYU out West, never been out West before. And, you know, the rest is history. Had a great, great experience there. Loved every second of it. That's incredible. Growing up, when would you say was the transition or the point in your career where you were like, you know what, I, I'm really good at basketball. Like I could, I could do this, you know, for a big part of my career, like beyond college. Like when was that point where you truly believed that? I always tell people this. I think that that's a difference, the difference between, you know, why I was able to, to kind of do what I did and why some other people, you know, maybe weren't able to that were probably more talented than me and better than I was and more athletic and all of these things. I truly believe that I was going to play in the NBA since I was six years old, literally no other, no other thing. I never thought of anything else. 
didn't have a plan B. Um, that was, that was my plan. I truly believed it and just went for it. You know what I mean? And just had a mindset of, okay, how can, how do I accomplish it? So I'd start making goals, you know, every year, um, I'd have goals for myself and I'm like, all right, if I can hit this goal this year, I'm moving towards the direction that I need to, to be at where I was going to, you know, be able to, to play in the NBA. And so I just set goals every single year to try to hit them. And I kept hitting these goals and kept hitting them, kept hitting them, kept working hard. And, uh, you know, eventually it happened, but I, my mindset was, I, I, it wasn't, it was definitely going to happen. And I really truly believe my mom always just telling me this, that brain is a super powerful thing. And if you can mm-hmm. see it in your mind, you can see it happening over and over and over again. Your mind doesn't know if that's, real or fake it, I mean it, it takes it as real reps you know so I think it's truly important that that people think that way and that's kind of how I thought I love I love how you break that down and obviously dude that was so cool because you talk about the mind and the power of your brain and like that's a lot of what we talk about with aim like we love health and fitness but at the end of the day like we're trying to help people understand that ambition can be a mindset you know and it can apply to your life but I think if you look across the board at very successful people like yourself and different people who have done super well in their field, they, they always have that inherent confidence and belief in what they're doing. Right. And you've got that goal of going to the NBA, but the people, I think that it's where the, the separation is, is the people that can break it down and strategically attack the small goals to get there. They don't get overwhelmed by when you're six years old, oh, I want to play in the NBA. You're like, okay, strategically, I'm going to do these things to get there while still keeping your eyes and, you know, the sight on going to the NBA. I think that's super, super strong. Yeah, for sure. I, that's really important. My family's always been big on goal setting and, and, you know, something that I've definitely, you know, put a premium on and I like to write my goals down so I can look at them um, and see them every day, um, understand what my focus is and what it is. So, yeah, I think you have to, because if you have the overarching goal at that, age or when you're young it's hard to see that happen um you know it's it takes a long time for that to happen you know so you have to keep yourself driven motivated um with with little goals to be like all right i'm gonna hit this one i'm gonna work you know three months i have a tournament coming up i want to be the mvp of this tournament like i don't so i gotta hit it hard for three months and focus in on that and and you know go out and, and play the best you can that's awesome man I love I love that right there stepping foot on BYU's campus as a freshman you're like man this is crazy college basketball talk about that transition and like how your kind of career escalated pretty quickly yeah it was uh yeah I loved uh loved my experience at BYU I mean when I got out there as a freshman no one knew who I was at all I mean I'm small town upstate New York um the my teammates didn't know who I was at all they were just like you're you're the kid that was from New York the you know short curly haired kid (laughs) still like you're the scorer you're the guy like yep and then once I started playing they're like okay I can see you know a little bit I can see a little something in you but um you know as a freshman uh, I didn't start start at all didn't start any games came off the bench every every game that season had two senior guards that were playing ahead of me. Um, so I had, that was, that was pretty difficult, you know, at first, just because, you know, I felt like I should have been playing more. Um, but it was good for me. It kept me motivated, kept my eye on the prize being like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta get better. You know, if I want to really, you know, make some noise, you know, in this team and in this league in the country, I have to, I have to get better. And, and that freshman year definitely motivated me to do that. And then sophomore year started, and, you know, it didn't look back from, from starting at that point, um, you know, but it was definitely gradual for me. I think the thing was, I, I got better every year. Um, you know, I didn't start and then I started and averaged about 16. And then I, my junior year, I averaged like 21 or 22. And then my senior year I averaged 28 or 29, somewhere in that area. So I, like every year I gradually got better. And that was my focus every, every off season. It's like, okay, what can I do to improve? Um, to get better? What do I need to do to help our team get better? Um, what can I, what can I do? What can I bring to the team? So I, I focused on that every summer and, and saw a gradual improvement. And then, you know, senior year, um, end of junior year, senior year is when it really started to kind of go nationwide and people started to actually see who we were as a team and who I was as a player. That's incredible. I, I love that. I want to, I really want to dive into that though. You start 
improving, you know, your game speaks for itself. Obviously, from a statistic statistic standpoint, like people recognized the talent you had, what you were able to do on the floor. As you started to amass this kind of national media presence and the news and people like following your your career, how were you able, how did you navigate that and how did you manage receiving that type of spotlight while also leading your team and, and keeping the team goals in check and in focus? Yeah, it's a great question because it it was super interesting because, you know, people knew who I was like end of junior year, beginning of senior year. They knew that we were a good team. They knew that we're someone to be reckoned with. I mean, we're top 15 all year. I mean, we got to number three in the country eventually. You know, we were we were really good that our senior year. Um, but it was like, yeah, they're they're a good team. But, we you know, we never, we want to see more. We want to see more. And, you know, then we ended up playing against San Diego State at our place. And um, this was two top five teams uh, playing against each other. And it was the first time it happened in the Mountain West Conference. And Kawhi Leonard was playing on the other team, you know, obviously, you know, great player. And uh, um, and they had just great athletes, um, really well coached. So it was a big game and everyone was watching it nationally. You know, everyone was, was focused in on this game. And, you know, I had a great game. I had 43 points and I was able to win we were able to win the game and beat them and it became number three in the country. But after that game, everything changed. Media was going crazy. Um, they had a Jimmer tracker on ESPN from then on out. I got, I was talking on every single talk show you could possibly think of sports show. It just went nuts. My life changed literally overnight. I went from being a normal college student to not being able to go anywhere without, um, being mobbed by people, especially in, in Utah or wherever, even and honestly, anywhere I was going, it just kind of was pretty crazy. It changed overnight, but I didn't change necessarily. I didn't change as a person. And I think that was the biggest thing. My parents always taught me to be level-headed, to be a good person. <laughs> you know, you're not better than anybody else. You're still the same Jimmer, still the same person on and off the court. And I think that having that perspective really helps with your teammates. They don't see you as someone who is different than them. You know, I was always, I was joked with them. I always treated them the exact same, whether I was doing interviews or whether I was, you know, on the bench, I was the same person. I had the same drive. I was competitive. I wanted to win, but I was also a good person to them and tried to help them in any way I could on and off the court, genuinely interested. And, and your teammates can see that they can pick up on those things. They can see if you're genuine or not. And I think that's a lot that that has to do with it. If you can be someone, you know, who they truly respect and truly like off the court, they're going to be happy for your success and for the team's success all on the court. And ultimately we were playing well as a team. And I think that was, you know, the biggest thing. It wasn't about, it wasn't about me in the locker room, you know, obviously outside of the locker room, people would see me and they'd see the highlights. They do that. They, you know, that was, that was the big deal. But ultimately when we were in that locker room it was about our team. And so if you can approach it that way, um, you know, even when you're getting the spotlight, your teammates will respect you for it. And, you know, they'll, they'll want you to succeed and they'll want the whole team to succeed. That, that's incredible because to me, I think that's like the most interesting element. Obviously, when you're playing an individual sport, the the spotlight, the limelight, whatever you want to call it, can can really go up and down however it goes. And, and you can kind of just be in that moment. But when you're on a team and there's there's so many more people don't realize how many dynamics there are, how many moving pieces there are with a team. And I think, you know, for you to just remain humble and to embrace it, obviously maximize what you can do with your personal brand, but at the same time, create that trust and those bond with your teammates. That's a very genuine bond. I think that's like, it's hard to do that. And I think you, you said it really well, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, that's a difficult kind of dynamic to balance. Um, but that's, that's amazing. You're able to do that. And I think the team having that much success also plays into y'all being able to do that successfully. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that you know, for me, um, that was the most important thing. Like, I just wanted to be the same person. Um, but I wanted to show them that I, that I cared, you know, I wanted to show them that, you know, I'm, st I'm still the same guy. Yeah. I was just on pardon the interruption or something like that, you know, and I was, but I, I always tried to bring it back to the team too. It wasn't just 
And I didn't want it to be just about me. I wanted it to be about the team. So I think it was really important for me to, to understand that and to have that perspective. And, you know, obviously a lot of it had to do with my upbringing from my parents and, and everybody who, you know, taught me, taught me good things and taught me, you know, to, to live the right way and, and try to be a leader. Um, even if, you know, you're being, you're having a lot of success in your field. A hundred percent. Yeah. I'll, do you have, sorry, one second. You're good. Okay. Go ahead. Do you have a, uh, I want, I want one like quick, quick story. One of the crazier things that's happened to you while you were at BYU, just a crazy Jimmer moment experience. Yeah. I mean, so just going back to that San Diego state game, there's cut, there's a lot that have been, that have been pretty cool, but just going back to that San Diego state game, I was, you know, it was crazy. It was the first time that I'd ever had some, where the, the school or the fans rushed the court and so they rushed the court and I was like really excited after the game and then I turned to like oh th this could be a little bit crazy you know people started to grab me pull me everywhere you know that type of stuff while they were doing it. And I was like all right I gotta try to get out of here so I you know I got out of there um you know security came and kind of pulled me out and I got behind like the scorers bench and I was kind of just sitting there and there was a group of security guards around me and all the fans were just on the court and all the way up the, the Merritt Center. And Merritt Center holds 23,000 people. So, I mean, it's a big stadium. So I was sitting there behind it and I have a picture of it where I'm just looking out and it's just like a sea of people just staring at me, cheering, you know, love, loving life and just so happy about the moment. I just remember having that. Um, and it was just, it was incredible to be able to remember that moment and see that. So I think that one of the, things that happened afterwards is that people stayed in the stadium to try to see me after the game so there were there was like thousands and thousands of people out still on the court so my uh athletic director comes in he's like jimmer you can't go outside he's like you can't go back to normal and go out walk to your car like normal like you normally would so i was like all right what do you want me to do he's like all right so I had to have my girlfriend, my wife now, um, Whitney, I was called her and I was like, Hey, I need you to drive your car underneath the stadium, like back in the docks where, you know, they load stuff. She's like, so she had to drive her car all the way down there so that she picked me up and then drive me out of the stadium. Um, so I could get out without having a mob come, you know, after me. And that was, I never had this happen before, you know, it was just kind of super crazy, you know, and I had to do that for the rest of the season. People started to find out where we were coming from, you know, and coming out. So they'd wait as we come out of the docks and they'd bang on our door and bang on the windows as we were driving through, like to saying congratulations, like excited about stuff. Like it's like a movie, you know, it's just pretty crazy. And there's a lot of other great things that happened that year. But I just remember that kind of happening and, and changing my life overnight. And even little things like going to class or going to the dining hall, like stuff like that obviously changed as well, right? Yeah, hundred percent. It was difficult to kind of walk around campus. Honestly, I just get asked for pictures and autographs constantly. Um, you know, so I started to, you know, ask teachers if I could do more things online and, and not actually, you know, have to, to go to actually go to class as much. Um, you know, be able to kind of just do things because it was just kind of it was it was pretty crazy. I, I, I mean, it's hard to describe, but, you know, I just couldn't really go anywhere without being just distracted by a lot of people. <laughs> that is that is incredible, man. I, I want to touch on NIL. This is such a yeah. kind of a big thing, college basketball right now. I think the the transition in July was was a big deal for a lot of players. And I know there was a lot of there was a handful of guys that were really kind of at the forefront speaking of it publicly. I think it's easy to say, I don't even think it's an argument. Like you would have been by far one of the highest paid athletes, you know, if NIL was around like during your time in college, like what are, what are your thoughts on kind of the whole landscape of college basketball now that NIL is, is what it is? Yeah. Ultimately I think it's a really good thing. I mean, players should be able to make money on their name image and likeness. I mean, it's just the way that, I mean, everyone else can, everyone else, if you're just a normal college student, you could do it. Um, but if you're a college athlete, you, you know, for some reason weren't able to do it. So I think that that's the, it was the right move. Um, you know, ultimately now saying that it, it complicates things a lot, you know what I mean? It, it takes, there's a lot of different things that come with, you know, earning money 
as a professional athlete. Um, there's a, there's a balance there. They have to, to focus on, you know, ultimately, you know, what's the, your priorities? How do I manage my time? How do I manage my money? Like there's financial literacy that comes into play all of a sudden with all these young kids getting a bunch of money and what do we do with it? Um, it could, it could, you know, it could hurt some kids, you know, mentally and, and, you know, get their priorities maybe a little bit off. Um, so there's definitely a, a fine line and now it's like how do schools deal with it? Um, recruiting wise, uh, how is that going to work out? Do you have to start paying for these kids to come play? Um, you know, is there a, a price for a top recruit? You know, all of these things come into play now that, you know, never came into play before. So now it's going to be a learning curve, but ultimately kids should be able to make uh, money off of their name. And I think if that was the case when I was in, in college, I would definitely have started my career with a lot more money um, than I did before. <laughs> Um, it would have been, it would have been great. Obviously people were trying to make money off my name and they were making money off my name, but I couldn't see any of that money, um, when I was, when I was younger. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, I definitely would have been curious to see what type of deal I could have gotten and what type of deals would have come my way. Um, you know, but ultimately, you know, things worked out for me in a, in a, in a positive way. And, and now I just try to teach kids, you know, when they ask me about it, just, Hey, enjoy it. Definitely do it. Go out and make as much money as you can, but make sure that you realize you're there for a reason. You're there to be an athlete and that's got to come first, no matter what, like people will be pulling you all different places to do photo shoots and, and this and that, and then blah, blah, blah. But you need to focus on your game because if you don't get better, then you're not going to get to where you want to be. Even if you make the money you, you are in college. That's a, that's a really good point. I think for me, it's, there's like the balance where, and I was I joking at the beginning of the episode about us shooting like I have I was not near the player you were obviously like I didn't play professionally or anything but I kind of recognized kind of midway through my career that there's obviously going to be life after basketball and I was like how can I strategically start to build my brain and set myself up to to handle that transition as smoothly as possible now when when you're the kind of player that you were, you probably had a slightly different mindset where you knew you were going to continue to play but I think there is a lot to be said for those players that probably aren't going to have long professional careers to utilize this time in college as, as an advantage and to be able to build their, their brand. So I, when did you kind of start building your brand out? Obviously basketball is intertwined to it, but like, it wasn't just basketball. Now you're like starting to mobilize your business as a brand. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Cause you know, I sound old saying this, but when I, you know, was back in college, there wasn't much social media to be honest yeah. with you. Like Twitter had just, Twitter had just started. Sorry. My, my child is yelling at me right now. You're good. Not right now, okay. Sorry. I'll start that over. So <laughs> back when, uh, back when I was in college 10, 11 years ago, we didn't really have much social media. It was mostly just Twitter. They didn't have Instagram, you know, TikTok, all these different things they didn't have. They had Twitter, but I didn't even have a Twitter until like halfway through my senior season. Um, you know, they were like, you probably should get a Twitter. You'll probably get a lot of followers and, you know, <laughs> like, oh, you're probably right. So I should probably do that. So I didn't really start branding myself more until after, you know, until after college, basically. I mean, you know, there's Facebook out there and everything, but everything was so new that I didn't even know how to brand myself at that point. It's like I didn't, some of the pictures that I posted on Instagram, the first things that I picked, posted, I looked back and I was like, what was I doing? What was I posting? <laughs> Look at and you're like, this is really weird why I was posting it. And now you're like, oh yeah, you can use it as a good positive thing to promote yourself in the way you want to promote yourself. Um, so once I got out of college and started to get into the NBA and and uh, had some, you know, emotional deals that I started to do and, you know, shoe deal, all these things. Then I started to kind of learn how to use social media in a positive way. And I've only gotten better at it as I've, you know, gone throughout my career of how I want to brand myself. What are the things that I want to post? Um, who do I want to be following? Who do I want to, you know, who, what influencers do I want to be associated with? What brands do I want to be associated with? there's so many things that go into it. Um, and it's kind of just trying to learn, um, as you go, cause your social media can be a double-edged sword. It can be really great, but also if you tweet something or you put something out there that you don't want, it's out there for the rest of your life at this point, you know? So you have to be, you know, definitely have to be careful with that, but, um, you have to be strategic about it. 
make sure you understand what you're posting um, and truly think about what you want to be portrayed as a person and, you know, as a, as a business person, because that's, you know, the ultimately who you're going to try to target and the audience that you're going to go after. A hundred percent. I agree. I think someone like you, who is, you know, you talk a lot about like your brand, your platform, like everything was kind of built. It was definitely, there was a chunk of it built before social media was a big thing. Social media can be a bad thing if it's idolized or used the wrong way, but with it, with good intentions, it can be a really cool way to reach so many people. And like, you know, obviously while you were playing in college, even before social media was big, like you were still making a massive impact on the youth, the next generation of basketball players, like people that looked up to you could resonate with your story. And I think, you know, now you're able to use social media, you can just touch so many more lives and make such a bigger impact than you ever would have, you know, just by watching you play on TV. Absolutely. I mean, that's, and that's why, you know, like I say, a double-edged sword. I mean, I want to use the the good parts and I want to try to, to help people and, and promote, um, you know, good things, um, promote family oriented things, promote, you know, basketball and, and getting better and, and pushing through adversity and, and being kind and doing all these different things. Um, these are, are important to me and these are why um you know it's important to post things that you want to post and you want people to think of you as because you know that's ultimately people that don't know you they're going to know what you post and that's what they're going to think of you as a person i mean it's just the way that it is so you just have to to recognize that and use it in a positive manner because you can really touch so many people lot people's lives if you do it in a positive way a hundred percent as we kind of wrap up this conversation of the kind of your career and playing, I just want you to give us one kind of takeaway you've learned either from the NBA or playing overseas that you've really learned from the game, but apply to your life. Something that's really helped you kind of overcome. It could be overcoming adversity, finding success, maintaining balance, whatever that looks like. I'd love to just kind of pick your brain about, you know, one thing you've kind of picked up on throughout your professional career. Yeah, I think for me, um, control what you can control. That's always something that is, that's come to my mind, um, you know, throughout my career. And, you know, I've had some really great times in my career. I've been at the top of the top. And then I've had some tough times in my career where I've been really down and down in the dumps and been, you know, you know, kicked around a little bit. And both of them are good for you. You know, both of them are, are great to experience. But ultimately, I always tell people when one door closes, another door opens. And, it's about you to try to take that opportunity to make the best of that situation. Um, You know, and that's kind of, for me, you know, I stopped playing in the NBA, you know, I got cut by the Spurs. And then after that, it was time for me to, to find a different career path, um, you know, in a different place. And then I ended up going over to China and I was like, I could have sulked about it. I could have been like, you know what? I'm over this. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm just going to go over there, be a normal player, whatever, do these things. But instead I was like, you know what, I'm going to be here. So let's make the best of it. Let's go out there and let's crush it. And, you know, I was able to go and win the MVP the first season and had a great season with my, uh, with my team. And then all of a sudden things started exploding again over in China. And, and, you know, I've had really great success over there and kind of changed the narrative of my career and who I was as a player and all these things. So, I mean, there's, I think that's a really good lesson in life, not just in athletics. Like sometimes things aren't, most of the time, things aren't going to turn out the exact way you want them to. So it's important once you see that door closing and another door opening that you take that opportunity and you take it head on full advantage of it. Dude, that is good. I think it's like the people that have the mindset where they can say, okay, I'm going to make the most out of every situation, highs, lows, and just continuously move forward. I think that really sets people apart. Like Kobe talks about that a lot. Like I've seen videos of him saying, you can't get too high. You can't get too low. You just got to keep moving forward. And then what you said too, just being present in the moment is like you, you get so much out of it, right? Because if you're, you're on a high, you're on a low, there's different learnings, there's different emotions that are going to come with those environments and situations. But just the consistency of just being in the moment and making the most and just, honestly, I think there's a lot of things to be said about gratitude, like having gratitude in both, because there's, like I said, things you'll learn and take away from both that'll help you as you continue to move on in your story. Absolutely. Gratitude's a huge thing. Be grateful for what you have and and understand that we're all blessed in certain ways 
um, you know, some different ways than others. Um, but it's, if you can have that mindset and understand that, you know, you have a lot of blessings in your life that things can uh, continue to, to go in your way. A hundred percent. This segues nicely into what I want to ask you next about gratitude. You've been extremely generous with your time and resources. I want to hear more about your foundation, um, kind of your heart to, to create that and start that and where, you know, what you guys do and kind of where that's headed. Yeah, it's been amazing. I started my foundation uh, about 10 years ago with my family called the Fidet Family Foundation. Um, and, you know, ultimately my family was always really close growing up and we wanted to try to help as many families as we possibly could. That was our mission. Um, when we started it and we started in my, my hometown in Glens Falls in that upstate New York area. And then in, in Provo and, and BYU area, um, that's where we started. And we just tried to help families out. And then once we got to understand what families needed, most of the time the parents would say, Hey, we need, we want help with our children. We want to make sure our children are okay. So we took that and we're like, okay, what can we do with this? So we got into schools and started doing kind of anti-bullying programs um, in schools and, you know, had some good success with that. But ultimately, once we got into the schools, the one thing that the theme that kept coming back to us was kindness. And so that's what we've kind of morphed to now is we have choose kindness programs. Um, So we've been fortunate now to be able to, you know, hook up with uh, uh, the Cook Center, who is uh, another foundation, someone that I that I met um, out in China, actually, that lives in Utah. And uh, they've they're helping us get into schools nationwide with our choose kindness programs. So we're we're in uh, we're in over 45 schools nationwide right now um, with our choose kindness programs. Um, you know, helping, you know, thousands, hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of kids, um, you know, try to choose kindness and just be good to people, be inclusive, um, you know, and, and just try to teach them from a young age that being kind is a good thing and that it's cool and that's, you know, everyone's different, but that's okay. And we want to all be good, you know, to, to each other and just make sure that you're, you're trying to choose kindness. And we're trying to create cultures of kindness in schools and in the communities that they're in. So it's been really amazing to see, like, I've been so humbled to see um, all the schools that's reached out this year for us to all, all over the country. I mean, we're in literally every part of the country at this point, like different school districts, uh, different parts of the country. It's, it's amazing to see. And, you know, hopefully it'll continue to grow and people will still, you know, want to support. So it's been awesome. Dude, that's incredible. I love, I love the message there. And I think it's so, it, it can be so easy and simple, right? Like it's sometimes in life, the, the most simple things that we try to overcomplicate that can truly make the world a better place. Like literally just being kind, yeah. serving someone else, trying to find a way to make someone else better. Like very simple. Anyone can do it. Yeah. We overcomplicate it, but that's amazing. You're spending time and energy and putting that, that energy into the world. Like that's, it's very needed. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. I mean, for me, it's, it's been a blessing to be able to give back. That's ultimately what it's about for me. I want to be known as a good person over anything, you know, and I, and that's what I, the way I try to live my life and want people to understand. And, and uh, you know, it's been, it's been amazing to see the support that we've gotten so far and, and uh, just trying to do the best we can to help out and, and do the the best we can to teach kids um, how important it is. Let's go. Man, this has been an incredible episode. As we wrap this thing up, I do want to touch on one last thing. You have an exciting project coming to life here shortly. I want you to talk about that a little bit. I'll let you kind of break the ice and announce it, but super excited for you. And I think it's going to be a really cool thing to help a ton of people as well. Yeah, for sure. I'm super excited about it. I'm coming out with my my own basketball training app. Um, you know, I started kind of doing basketball training tips on Instagram and TikTok for the last about a year or so. And people have really, really liked it. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. And people then started to come up, hey, will you train my kid? And will you, you know, do this and that? And at this point, I just don't quite have the time to be able to do that with everyone and all places. Maybe eventually I'll get into that more. I'm still playing and still having things that I have going on. Um, But I thought ultimately it would be a great idea to be able to be able to give back to these kids that want some training. So I created a basketball training app where you're going to learn all different types of things from shooting to dribbling to the drills that I've did as a young kid drills that I do now 
the technique of how to be able to do different shots that I do, different drills that I've done, shooting challenges. I'll have nutrition on there. I'll have conditioning stuff on there. We'll have, you know, weight training stuff on there, um, you know, positive things. Um, so, I mean, you'll be able to train with me at some point, you know, live training sessions and you know you'll be able to text me through the app so that if you have questions i'll be able to answer all these different things that's going to be super super cool um and i've got great great feedback so far with the preliminary um you know rounds that i put out of me wanting to you know put out an app and, and try to help kids so it should be really fun i'm excited about it it's been going really well been working hard on a lot of content and ultimately hopefully uh it helps with a lot of kids dude i'm so excited for you i wish looking back, I could have had, you know, an opportunity to train with you on an app like that growing up. That, this is such a, such a cool concept. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. it's the way the world is trending um, with technology yeah. and just having stuff at the palm of your hand on a mobile device. But I think if people take it seriously and really want to invest in themselves, I think training with you is is the perfect opportunity to do that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. I've, I've done a lot of training in my day. You know, I, like I said, I've, I've worked hard. I mean, I, like, I'm not the most athletic or biggest person out there or anything. So I've I've had to kind of, you know, make up for it with skill level. And so that's something that I put a lot of detail into. So I have a lot of insight on that. And I, I want to be able to share it with everyone and share what I experienced and what I've done to try to get to where I am. And, and people look at me and like, Hey, he looks, he looks like I, he looks like I do. I think I can do what he does. And you guys can, you just got to go work hard and focus on details and have a belief in yourself. You got to believe in yourself. I love how you ended it like that, man. Zimmer, thank you so much for your time. This has been an incredible episode. I'm so excited for everything you've got going on. And uh, yeah, I wish you and your family the best and good luck with your app, man. That's going to be sick. Sounds good. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Have a great one. Love what you're doing. Thank you, man.